This is Doug DeMuro, and today we're going to talk about supercars that you have never heard of. It's an interesting topic because supercars usually get a ton of press and excitement and publicity, but some of them remain tremendously obscure. So today we're going to talk about the unknown supercars. <laughs> Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website for cool cars from the modern era with free listings. You can list your cool car for free and auction it on Cars and Bids. And we've had some great sales recently, including this BMW M3 Competition, which sold for just under $45,000, this fantastic Cadillac CTS V Coupe, which brought $36,000, and this amazing Hummer pickup truck, an old school military Humvee, which sold for $20,000. We love the weird stuff too. If you're looking to buy or sell a cool enthusiast car from the modern era, Cars and Bids is the place to do it. With daily auctions and great selection and free listings, check it out at carsandbids.com. Okay, so supercars that you have never heard of. Like I said, it's a surprise that you can make a supercar and it fades into such obscurity that car enthusiasts don't know about it. But they do exist. There are unknown supercars. And I've done a little research and my own interest in quirky, obscure cars has helped me here. And so I'm going to share with you 10 supercars you've never heard of. Okay, number one, and by the way, this list is alphabetical. It's not like ranked in order of preference, just A to Z. Number one, the XM Mega Track. <laughs> okay, this thing. So there was this French company called XM, which I guess got with another company called Mega. So it was a XM Mega was the company. And they made micro cars, like electric micro cars. In Europe, there are certain countries that allow you to drive certain really little vehicles without a full driving license, which can be useful in cities. You don't necessarily need a big car, but you want something bigger than a motorcycle. There are these little kind of city cars that you can drive around with like a motorcycle driver's license. So this company made these cars. And then at some point in the early 1990s, they decided to make a supercar as well. This was a four wheel drive exotic sports car with a mid-engine V12 borrowed from the Mercedes-Benz S600 at the time. It made about 390 horsepower. Unfortunately, it used a four-speed automatic transmission because <laughs> things are already weird enough. Why not throw an automatic in it? And it did zero to 60 in somewhere in the mid five second range, which doesn't sound all that great. But the reason is the XAM Mega Track was absolutely huge. Even though this company had the rep for building micro cars, this thing was enormous. It is wider than a Hummer EV, the massive electric Hummer pickup truck. It weighed 5,000 pounds, even though it was an early 90s supercar. It was four-wheel drive, and the thinking was that it was both a supercar on the road and it could kind of off-road. So there are some like press photos that show it like up on a hill and like that kind of thing, or climbing a little bit. And that was the XM Mega Track. Now, one of these drives around Monaco, and there are videos of it driving in Monaco and photos of it in Monaco with uh, Austrian like license plates. And it's just the stupidest thing. It's this massive supercar that towers over even normal cars today. Um, and, and there it is. Now, the other interesting thing about this, this was called the XM Mega was the brand. So the car itself was called the Track. Most people have never heard of this car. The few that have think, well, it's called the Mega Track because it was like a huge performance car. So like Mega Track. No, it was called the Track. <laughs> That doesn't make any sense. The whole thing was ridiculous. My understanding is they only made maybe six or 10 of these, uh, but it did exist and it was a V12 supercar that you've never heard of. Okay, next on the supercars you've never heard of list, the Chisetta Marauder V16T. So this is an absolutely crazy one. First off, it is a mid-engine early 90s supercar with a V16. V10, V12, no, this is a V16. 
and a manual transmission. And it was created by a designer named Claudio Zampoli, and then also a music composer named Giorgio Moroder, who's actually pretty famous. He's produced a lot of popular songs, even popular here in the United States. They were both Italians, but Moroder was wealthy and popular. And these two guys, I guess, they met and they realized they had sort of similar automotive taste. They wanted to create a car. So you got a designer and a musician together to create a car. So the car was styled by Gandini, who did a lot of Italian exotic cars from this era. And the design has a lot of Lamborghini Diablo in it, as you can see. And that makes sense. It was exactly the same era. The V16T came out like early 90s, just when the Diablo did. So uh, Cizetta was is the Italian letters uh, C and Z for Claudio Zampoli's initials. And uh, Giorgio Moroder and Zampoli apparently didn't really see eye to eye on this car. And so Moroder dropped out and, and Zampoli made a few of them, but I guess he only made about 13 uh, before the car kind of stopped and people stopped buying. They were incredibly expensive back then. And one recently sold at auction for big money. It was incredibly expensive now too, even though they're incredibly obscure cars. Amazingly, the website for this company is still up. And in theory, you, apparently you could still order one if you wanted to, but uh, that's the V16T. Okay, next up, obscure supercars that you've never heard of. How about the Ferrari F90? <laughs> yes, this thing. You've heard of the F40, the F50, the F90. So this is an absolutely ridiculous looking Ferrari. Uh, and it was built for the Sultan of Brunei in the late 80s, early 90s. And it was based on the Ferrari Testarossa. Now, the Sultan of Brunei and that car collection, they were so wealthy that they commissioned various automakers at the time to build them various one-off special cars designed solely for their tastes. And so Aston Martin made them unique cars and Jaguar and Rolls-Royce and Bentley and Ferrari. And there were a couple of one-off Sultan of Brunei only Ferraris, but the F90 is definitely the weirdest. It was based on the Testarossa, so it presumably uses the same flat V12, um, but it just looks crazy. Of all the crazy Sultan of Brunei cars, and there were many, the F90 is one of the absolute most bizarre looking. And so, um, Again, presumably the same flat V12 as Testarossa. Nobody really knows because the Sultan bought the car. It's been there 30 years. It's never gotten out and nobody knows what the deal is, but it's incredibly cool, uh, incredibly bizarre. And apparently they made six of them for the Sultan and they're all there. Okay, next up, supercars you've never heard of. How about the Ferrari 575 GTZ? Okay, you know the Ferrari 575. That was the car that replaced the 550 Marinello, front engine V12, uh, kind of mid-2000s Ferrari, right before the 599. But the GTZ was a Zagato version of this car. So it was designed by the famed Italian design house Zagato, and it was created to commemorate 50 years since the Ferrari 250, Ferrari's famous line of 250 cars, but specifically 50 years since the 250 GT Zagato, which was a very beautiful car and so they decided to make like a modern version of that based on the 575. What ended up coming out of it was, as you've seen in these photos, uh, like a regular 575, but bulbous. It wasn't exactly the most attractive car. In fact, it was rather unfortunate looking, like a 575 that's kind of puffy. <laughs> that's, that's what happened. And so they made six of those 575 GTZs. And then they decided they also wanted to do a convertible version. Now there was a convertible 575 called the Super America, but for some reason they made these Zagato versions on the 550s convertible model, which was called the Barchetta. So they made three 550 Zagatos that are open roof and then six 575 GTZs that are closed roof. None of them are particularly attractive cars, but they did exist and they are certainly the rarest versions of the 575 and the 550. Okay, next on my list of supercars you've never heard of, how about the Jaguar XJ220 Pininfarina? Okay, this is another Sultan of Brunei car, and this time it's a one-off. Only one of these was made. And so that's not really a super car. It's not like you can go buy this thing, but the reason I bring it up is it looks amazing. It looks like an actual Jaguar XJ220, but nice looking. You know, the problem with the XJ220 was always that its proportions were ridiculous. It was way too long, way too wide. It was too big. So Pininfarina, the Italian design company, was 
commissioned by the Sultan of Brunei to make a one-off special XJ220. And this is what they did. And I think it looks absolutely gorgeous. I think it's like a truly beautiful car. Now, interestingly, in addition to completely restyling the exterior, the Sultan also commissioned them to change the interior, which was made green, as you can see here, looks totally different, totally bizarre. And if you spent time in an XJ220, you'll know this is not how the XJ220 interior looked. It was all changed and it was made green. Now, interestingly, they also made an automatic transmission for it. This was made by the Williams F1 company um, instead of having the manual that was in all the XJ220. So a totally different vehicle and frankly, the best looking XJ220. Jaguar made the XJR15 supercar, the XJ220, and the best looking of all was a one-off for the Sultan of Brunei that nobody's ever gonna get to see. Okay, next up, an obscure supercars you've never heard of. The Ital Design Aztec. That is this thing, and as you can see, it is crazy looking. These were built to commemorate the 20th anniversary of Ital Design, which is the Italian design firm that has designed a lot of cars over the years. Many, many cars, including many famous cars. But in 1988, it was their 20th birthday, so they made this, and it is bizarre. Now, the look of it is pretty crazy to begin with, in part because the driver and passenger are separate, and so they communicate electronically because it's a totally open roof vehicle, and they're not even sitting next to each other. But Weirder still is the control panel on the side of the car where I've never been around one of these, but I've been told that like you enter certain codes and it will tell you certain things like your fuel range or I don't know, but that's what that does. It looks absolutely strange and I have no idea why they thought that would be something, but that's the car they made. Now, apparently they made around 20 of these. Uh, and they all used, of all the power, of all the weird powertrains they could have used, they used the Audi 2.2 liter turbo five cylinder that I have in my RS2. In this car, it was, it was not as much power as the RS2 got. It was around 200, 250 horsepower um, versus 310 in the RS2. But it, that was the powertrain in this bizarre Atel design Aztec. Okay, next up, supercars that you've never heard of. How about the Lamborghini Silhouette? You've heard of, presumably, maybe if you're watching my channel, the Oldsmobile silhouette, which was a minivan, but Lamborghini also made a silhouette. And here's the deal. So throughout the 70s, the 80s, the 60s, Lamborghini was famous for its flagship models, the Mura, the Countach, the Diablo, the Murcielago. But they also had entry-level cars that not as many people know about. You had in the 70s, the Uraco, and then in the 80s, the Yalpa, which I reviewed maybe a year or two ago. Um, but in between those two, there was kind of a, an interim uh, entry-level model called the Silhouette. And it was based on the Uraco, but it looked like the Yalpa. And so it was sort of like an interim car to bring you from the 70s to the 80s. It was made from 76 to 79, and they only made about 55 of these, but they did in fact make this car. It was the entry Lambo in the late 70s. And it kind of ushered in like the angular look that Lambos and other supercars had in the 1980s. Uh, the engine was a Lamborghini V8 with about 265 horsepower. And again, only 55 units built, not particularly popular before the Yalpa came out as sort of the more common entry Lamborghini. But the silhouette was there for a little while just before. Okay, next up on the list of supercars that you don't know about, how about the Nissan R390 GT1? Okay, so check this out. In the 90s, Nissan decides they wanna go racing at Le Mans. So they build this crazy prototype supercar race car, and they have to build it based on a road car, and so they made one. And then they went racing, but they kept the road car. And unfortunately, Nissan still has it. Now, the car competed at Le Mans for a couple years. It didn't do all that well. I guess it did well in the second year it competed. The first, I think it, it failed. It like blew up during the race. And it, but regardless, there was a road car version of it. And that's called the R390 GT1. Now, again, Nissan made one of these. I've actually seen it in person. Uh, and it's very cool and it's very special. It was similar to other um, road versions of Le Mans race cars, like the 911 GT1 that everybody knows about, the CLK GTR that everybody knows about. Well, here is Nissan's road version of its Le Mans car. Um, again, they only made one, but they did offer the ability to make more. For a million dollars back at the time, you could buy an R390 GT1 road car 
but nobody did it. Nobody took Nissan up on this. They were offering it and it was, it was never done, but it was available. This car had a 550 horsepower V8 with a sequential manual transmission. So it was like an early sequential manual. It was 1997 or so it was built and a mid engine rear wheel drive supercar from Nissan that is in obscurity. Okay, next up, supercars that you don't know about, the Vector M12, that would be this car. I would reckon this is probably the best known car on this list. Um, in part because everybody knows the earlier Vector, which was called the W8. I reviewed one of those, the video got a zillion views, but also that car is pretty well known for a lot of reasons, including its crazy styling. And so people know Vector and they know they made two cars. Most people know the W8, but the M12 also existed. So the genesis of the M12 is kind of bizarre. Vector created, the Jerry Weigert was the guy's name, he created the brand uh, and created the W8. But then there was a hostile takeover of the Vector company from a company called Megatech that was based in Indonesia. And the weirdest thing about this is that Megatech at this time, the mid 90s, also owned Lamborghini. <laughs> this is something that young people will maybe have, watching these videos maybe have trouble kind of comprehending. Lamborghini was not always a Volkswagen Audi brand. When I was a kid, it was always kind of in peril because it had all these different owners, including Chrysler. But at one point in the mid 90s, Lamborghini was owned by Megatech, which was this Indonesian company. And they built the Diablo, and they decided they wanted like an American version, America's supercar. So they used the Vector name, which some people already knew, and they created the M12, which was a new supercar with Diablo running gear, and they decided to sell them. Unfortunately, it wasn't popular. They built these in Florida, but you know, if people wanted a Diablo, they'd buy a Diablo. They didn't want to buy some unknown car from sort of an unknown brand. And apparently they only made 17 of these in the end throughout like the early mid 90s. But it had the same 5.7 V12 as the Diablo, same five speed manual transmission, mid engine, and it existed. Now this is kind of the forgotten vector because everybody knows the W8 which was built bespoke. And the M12 has sort of faded into obscurity because it was essentially a rebodied Diablo built in Florida, which is the last thing you want. But it existed and it's cool and it's obscure. Okay, last car on this list, threw this on as a bonus. It was not actually in production and it is not alphabetical, but it's a car that I love. And that would be the Cadillac CN. So this was a concept car that Cadillac built in like the early 2000s, I think like 2002 or so. And it's the only car on this list that wasn't actually built at least in one unit. Um, but I'm putting it here because two things. Number one, I love it. I think it is an amazing design. I think this design still looks great. So many people say this about so many car designs. That still looks modern. And I almost never agree. But I think the CN does, 20 years later, still look awesome. Like, super cool. And also, because everybody's forgotten about it. Like, this car was like this Cadillac supercar that was going to kickstart the brand in the new century. And it's kind of faded into obscurity, which is so sad because it is just so awesome. So this was a mid-engine Cadillac supercar. It had a 7.5 liter version of the North Star engine that was a V12. So all the Cadillacs back then had the North Star V8. It was, it was high tech, dual overhead cam, it was a big deal. It made a V12 version and put it in this car with 750 horsepower. And it had a sequential manual transmission and supposedly the concept car even ran and drove and operated. Um, and apparently at that time, there was even talk of production, of building this car in order to help Cadillac usher in this new era where they switched to more angular styling. They switched to rear wheel drive cars. They switched kind of a focus on a younger crowd. And I think this car would have had a huge effect and been very successful if Cadillac had done that. Just, hey, here is the Cadillac of the new era. Uh, but they didn't. They decided to kill it after just the concept car. And I have I have also seen the CN concept car in person. I have always been sad they didn't build it. And it's a concept, it's a supercar that everyone has forgotten about. And I just wish that that Cadillac CN had been built. I wouldn't be surprised if it had, if it was would be sitting here right now instead of Ford GT. I just think it was so cool looking. But uh, there you go. Those are your 10 best supercars that you've never heard of. Again, not many supercars out there people haven't heard of, but there are some, and these are 10 very obscure ones.